When I talk about civic ecology practices as playing a role not just in adaptation to small scale change, but also in transformation of social ecological systems in response to catastrophes like Superstorm Sandy, or even in response to climate change, you might be thinking, well, there's something wrong here. Isn't there kind of a mismatch? You're talking about very small scale practices and very large change and catastrophes. At the very small scale, for example, at the level of a vacant lot or a small, small stretch along a river, you have civic ecology practices that come to play. So for example, at the vacant lot, you might have the community garden, and along the small stretch of river, you have an artificial wetland restoration project. But then we can think of it larger scales. So for example, at the scale of an entire neighborhood or entire body of water, you have, it also you have practices and you have this adaptive cycle, but the practices that are coming into play are things like re-engineering an entire shoreline or redesigning a new community that is adapted to climate change. So then we can even go up and you might have a whole city like New York City and talk about redesigning or re-engineering its shoreline or even a region where you're gonna redesign or re-engineer in response to sea level rise. So essentially what you have are adaptive cycles, and you can think of them as cycles of release and reorganization, or even destruction and creation that operate at multiple scales. So for example, at the small scale, you have a small flood, it destroys, and then you have civic ecology stewards who create something like an artificial wetland. And at a larger scale, you have hurricanes that destroy. And then you might have professional design teams that then create a new environment. But we need a term for this idea of we have these multiple adaptive cycles operating at different levels. And so ecosystem scientists Buzz Holling and Lance Gunderson, who really came up with these ideas of adaptive cycles operating at multiple levels, struggled to come up with a term that would capture this idea of adaptive cycles operating at multiple scales. And they first start, considered using the term hierarchy, but they decided that the term hierarchy is really too burdened by this idea of rigid top-down processes are controlled. So, and in fact, in civic ecology practices, you have processes that can bubble up from the bottom. So there's not just top-down, there's also bottom-up. So what they did is they turn to Greek mythology for inspiration. And what they found was the Greek god of nature, whose name is Pan. Now, Pan isn't a particularly attractive fellow. He has horns and legs and a tail like a goat. He has a thick beard, a snub nose, and pointed ears. He also destroys and he creates. And he, as he roams the Arcadian mountains, Pan arouses feelings of panic in men, and he transforms nymphs who attempt to flee. So one fleeing nymph was transformed by Pan into a clump of reeds, out of which Pan created his famous Pan pipes. And he turned another nymph into a mountain fir, which was his sacred tree. And then finally a third nymph who attempted to flee just kind of faded away, leaving only her voice to repeat forever the mountain cries of the god Pan. So Holly and Gunders Gunderson, they were really intrigued by this character, Pan. And they decided that the images evoked by Pan of unpredictable change and transformation were perfect for the notion of change and transformation in adaptive cycles. So the scientists combined the image of Pan and that notion of hierarchy, and they came up with a new term. And that term is panarchy. So there are two features that distinguish a panarchy from a hierarchy. So the first feature, within a panarchy, there are phases of destruction and reorganization or transformation in adaptive cycles. And these phases allow for the establishment of new practices or innovations to emerge. And this doesn't just happen at the very small scale civic ecology practices, but also at multiple scales, like in these larger redesign efforts. And the second is that there's connections between levels and they go both ways. 
not just top down, but also bottom up. So if you think about it, if there's enough civic ecology practices, what may happen is those operating at the larger scale, the designers, the re-engineers, they may become aware of these practices and they actually may incorporate these practices into their larger redesigns or re-engineering of, for example, shorelines. And so this process where lower level processes in these small adaptive cycles scale up is called revolt. Now there's a second way in which the levels interact and that is from the top down. And this process is referred to as remembrance. So you can think of these larger, for example, re-engineering processes. And you can think about the people involved and they have certain knowledge and or resources that are stored and contained or even what we might say remembered in the larger adaptive cycles. And these can be things like how to re-engineer entire shorelines or how to propagate native species used in these larger redesign efforts. But the lower level adaptive cycles in the panarchy can use these resources so they can move down and be used by civic ecology practices. The notion of panarchy enables us to envision how small scale processes can scale up through these levels of adaptive cycles in the panarchy as more people like you get involved in stewardship. But also as civic ecology stewards, we can draw on the resources of the larger adaptive cycles, the formal design expertise, those native plants that these larger adaptive cycles are propagating, or maybe the people involved who have some influence and know how to influence and connect with policymakers. So by drawing on these resources, we can play a larger role in both adaptation and transformation, in reorganization and creating solutions, or in resilience in light of the larger issues that we face like climate change.